Well, my voice is better this week. Last week I was in the middle of that cold, and as I said, I had my Orion Samuelson voice. By midweek I was up to Max Armstrong. <laughs> now I'm kind of back fully, but if, I, if you hear a little bit of scratch still in my voice, it's still hanging on just a little bit. But I want to read for you just a couple of verses for, from our gospel reading from today, from John chapter 1. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, when I, was, uh, when I was a kid, I was a huge baseball fan, still am, and loved the Chicago Cubs ever since I was a, a, a little squirt. And my favorite player, my boyhood hero, was Billy Williams. It, it probably had something to do with the fact that my name was Billy. And when I started playing Little League Baseball and they asked me what position I wanted to play, I always said left field, because that's where Billy Williams played, played left field for the Cubs. And, and, uh, and I was a pretty good glove, so they, they would say, no, we need you at shortstop. And I'm like, can I please play left field? But uh, when we were choosing uniform numbers, I always wanted to be number 26, because Billy Williams wore 26. And if I couldn't get number 26, I would ask, do you have number 13? Because that's half of 26. And, <laughs> I went through a period where I wanted to be called Billy Leo because Leo was Billy Williams' middle name. <laughs> and when our first child was born, our daughter Becky, along with the joy and excitement of that event, I had the extra thrill of knowing that she was born on June 15th, which is the birthday of Billy Williams. <laughs> now fast forward now to the year 1997, and we had taken our kids to a Cubs-Brewers game up at the old county stadium in Milwaukee. And, um, the kids wanted to stay after a while, see if they could get some player autographs. So we were standing outside of the player's exit after the game, and a pretty good crowd was gathering. And suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a door open about 50 feet to our left. And out stepped this 59-year-old African-American man, bald on the top, wearing glasses, carrying a duffel bag. <clears throat> I said to my kids, look over there. And they said, who's that? <laughs> and I said, that is Billy Williams. He was on the Cubs coaching staff at the time. So while the crowd was hovering around some unknown Brewers relief pitcher over here who had just come out of the locker room, I took my kids over to meet a Hall of Famer, a guy I had been waiting to meet since I was five years old. Now as much as I like baseball, I know that it really is an insignificant thing in the scope of eternity. And if I had never met my boyhood hero, my life would have been just fine. But it was kind of a thrill, to, and it was even more of a thrill to share that moment with my kids. I thought about that moment this week as I was studying this text from John chapter 1. I was thinking about what it must have been like for John the Baptist as he stood in the Jordan River one day, as we talked about last week, baptizing people, and suddenly the next person in line was a man that he knew, a man that he actually was related to. And as he baptized the man Jesus, God the Father revealed to him that Jesus was more than just a man. John learned that Jesus was the one, that he was the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. It was a moment that John had been waiting for his entire life. The story of John the Baptist begins with, with uh, part one. It begins with his miraculous birth. God was preparing John for his mission before he was even born. John's parents uh, 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 were a priest named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. And before John came along, they were childless. Now they were beyond the age where they thought they could have children. But in the first chapter of Luke's gospel, he describes how Zechariah went into the temple one day to do his priestly duties, and he was visited by the angel Gabriel, and Gabriel told him that his wife Elizabeth was going to have a son and that they should name that son John and that God had a very special mission for him. Now Zechariah, after first absorbing the shock of meeting an angel, questioned how can this be since he and Elizabeth were old. And Gabriel responded to his doubt by making him unable to speak until the day that John was circumcised and named, eight days after his birth. 
Luke then records a second miraculous event which took place when Elizabeth was about six months pregnant with John. Elizabeth and Zechariah got an unexpected visit from a relative of Elizabeth, a young girl from Nazareth named Mary. Mary was also uh, pregnant with a miraculous child and when she entered the house of Zechariah and Elizabeth, the baby inside of Elizabeth's womb uh, leaped for joy. God was already preparing John for his mission. Gabriel had told Zechariah that his son John would be the one who would prepare the people of Israel for the coming of the Messiah. And I'm sure that those words of Gabriel were repeated again and again to John as he was growing up. And then the last words that we hear about the young John are found in Luke chapter 1, verse 80, where Luke says this, The child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. At some point, John, after John grew up to adulthood, he left home. His parents probably had passed away. They were, they were, we already know they were older when he was born. And John went out and he lived in the Judean wilderness east of Jerusalem. Now some people believe that John lived in the Essene community uh, in a place <coughs> called Qumran. The Essenes were a group of Jewish religious scholars who lived simple lives in the desert. It was kind of like a monastic order almost. And they copied and they interpreted the Holy Scriptures and they stored them in scrolls. As many of those scrolls were found in 1947. They're called the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's quite possible that, that John lived with that community and studied the scriptures with them until the day that God called him to his mission. And finally that day came. Part two of John's life is where John burst onto the scene. John traveled north from Qumran to the area of the Judean wilderness where it descends into the Jordan River Valley. And he stood near the road that goes up from Jer Jericho to Jerusalem and he began to preach this powerful message of repentance. And the people responded. And they came to him in large crowds and they asked him, what must we do to be saved? And John told them, you must confess your sins and turn your hearts back to God and prepare your hearts for the coming of the Messiah. And in order to drive home that message, he said, you need to be cleansed from your sins. And so John led them down to the river and one by one he baptized them and told them that with this washing of water, you, this is a sign of the spiritual washing that God is doing inside of you, in your hearts and in your souls. John was now acting as the prophet that God had called him to be before he was even conceived. And very quickly, uh, the third episode of John's life was that John attracted the attention of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. John attracted the attention of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. The high priest and his cronies began to hear stories about a new prophet in the wilderness. Some people were even wondering if John was the Messiah. And this alarmed the priests because if John was going to start a messianic movement, get a crowd of people following him saying he's the Messiah, the Romans would surely hear about it. And the Romans might decide to revoke the Jews' religious freedom and shut down the temple. So that's what the priests, that, I mean, that's a source of their, of their power and their income. And so they're afraid for that. And so the chief priests and the Pharisees sent some representatives to investigate. They sent some lower level priests and some Levite temple guards. And they confronted John there by the Jordan River. They said, who are you? <clears throat> and I love the way that John, the gospel writer, the one who wrote the Gospel of John is a different John from John the Baptist. John who wrote the Gospel is one of Jesus' 12 disciples. So the Gospel writer John describes John the Baptist's answer to the religious leaders in verse 20. He's, John says that John the Baptist confessed. He did not deny, but he confessed, I am not the Christ. That triple emphasis, confessed, did not deny, confessed is John the Gospel writer's way of saying, John the Baptist vehemently and adamantly said, I am not the Christ, I am not the Messiah. John's message to the people was that the Messiah had arrived, the Messiah was among them, but he, John, was not that Messiah. And so the leaders asked him, they said, well then who are you? <clears throat> are you Elijah? Now why would they ask him that? <clears throat> 
It's because the last book of the Old Testament, the book of the prophet Malachi, said that before the Messiah came, the great prophet Elijah would come first to prepare the way. And so the people are saying to John, are you claiming to be the prophet Elijah? Have you returned from heaven to introduce the Messiah? And John said, no, I am not Elijah. John was not going to make any false claims about himself. He didn't think that he was an Old Testament prophet who had come back to life. He was just the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. But what John did not know was that he really was Elijah. This is what Jesus would later say about his cousin John in Matthew chapter 11. He would say that John <clears throat> was the last of the Old Testament prophets and that John was the greatest of them all. And then Jesus says in Matthew 11, 14 and 15, he says this, says to the crowd, he says, if you are willing to accept it, John is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears, let him hear. Jesus is saying John is the symbolic Elijah. Or as the angel Gabriel said to John's father in Zechariah, Father Zechariah in the temple, he said, your son will go before the Messiah in the spirit and power of Elijah. John was truly someone special. But when the religious leaders pressed him for an answer in verse 22 of our text, John simply said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. And this is why I love John the Baptist. Here he was with <clears throat> crowds of people streaming out into the wilderness to see him. Powerful religious leaders paying attention to him. John could have claimed to be the embodiment of Elijah. John could have claimed to be the Messiah himself and many people would have believed him. Many people would have followed him. But John said, it's not about me. I'm just here to point you to the one who is coming. And people in the Christian church today, we need to learn that lesson from John, that it's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. We live in a very me-centered society today. People want the world to cater to them. They want the world to revolve around them. They want the world to meet their needs. And if someone disagrees with their point of view, they, they want to challenge and mock and protest and sue and whatever. They can't stand to have somebody who disagrees with them. People in America today are so easily offended, so quickly outraged. They want everything just the way they want it and, and they will not tolerate anyone who does not think or act according to their will. But the church is not supposed to be like the culture. We're supposed to be like John. Our world is not about us. <laughs> Our world is about Jesus. It's about what Jesus wants. It's about his word. It's about his purposes. It's about his kingdom. But the religious leaders did not understand that. <clears throat> All they, had, they did understand self-promotion. They had seen many self-proclaimed messiahs before, and they understood that. They themselves, the priests, high priests, exalted themselves above the sinful rabble. So they got that. They understood that. But John was an enigma to them because John wasn't promoting himself. And they didn't get that. <laughs> In verse 25, they said to him, then, then why are you baptizing? What's the point if you're not setting yourself up to be a leader? If you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet, they said, why are you doing all this? And here in the fourth part of the story is where John finally reveals his agenda. John finally reveals his agenda. It reminds me of something my Uncle Ole did this past December. <laughs> One afternoon, a couple weeks before Christmas, he called up his son Hans. Hans and his wife Linda and their new baby um, are living out in California now. And Ole picked up phone, called him and said, Hans, I have some bad news for you. He said, your mother and I are getting a divorce. And Hans said, Dad, what do you mean? Have you filed any papers yet? And Oli said, no. Hans said, well, then I'll tell you what. Linda and I and the baby are going to fly to Minnesota this weekend, and I want you to promise me that you won't do anything before we get there. And Oli said, I promise. When Oli hung up the phone, Lena said to him, Oli, why did you tell Hans we're getting a divorce? We're not getting a divorce. Oli said, yeah, I know that, but now they're all coming home for Christmas, and they're going to pay for their own plane tickets. <laughs> That was Oli's hidden agenda. 
Well, in verses 26 and 27, John shares his hidden agenda. He says this. He says, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. John tells these religious leaders, the Messiah is already walking around in your midst, and you don't know him. John says, John says but I know who he is. It was someone who John had known all his life, a relative of his, the man from Galilee named Jesus. And John was not preaching and baptizing so that he could draw a crowd of followers around himself. John's ministry was for one purpose only. It was to introduce the people of Israel and the people of the world to their Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and that's exactly what John did the very next day in verses 29 and 30. The very next day after he had this conversation with the religious leaders, it says the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, John's got a crowd of people around him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. He said, This is the guy I was telling you all about yesterday. This is Jesus the Messiah. And that phrase, Lamb of God, was very insightful of John. The lamb had a very important symbolic meaning in Israel's history. 1,400 years earlier, on the night of the Passover, the night when the people of Israel were set free from their slavery in Egypt, every Israelite household was instructed to kill a lamb and roast it over fire for their supper that night. And then they were told to take some of the blood of that lamb and paint it on their doorposts. And later that night, as the angel of death went through the land of Egypt, killing the firstborn of each child, including the firstborn son of Pharaoh. The angel of death passed over the houses that were marked with blood. That's where the name Passover came from. And the children of Israel were saved. They were saved by the blood of the lamb. And later on in the sacrificial system that was established by Moses, they had a special day called the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And on that day, a lamb was symbolically killed for the sins of all the people, and its blood was sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. It was the only day throughout the whole year that anyone went behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant stood. The high priest went back there just to sprinkle the blood of the Lamb as a sign uh, that, that, uh, that the people's sins were forgiven. And then in chapter 53 of Isaiah, Isaiah describes the Messiah this way. He describes him as a lamb that is led to the slaughter who makes an offering for our guilt. So John is saying in our verses today, there goes your Savior. There goes the one who can forgive your sins. There goes the one who can save your soul and give you eternal life. And how did John know that Jesus was the Messiah, the Lamb of God? How did he suddenly know that his own cousin was the Savior of the world? Well, God had revealed it to John on the day that he baptized Jesus. John says in 32 and 33 of our text, he says, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. And I myself did not know him. He, he knew who Jesus was. But he said, until that moment, I didn't know he was the Messiah. But he who sent me to baptize with water had said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So John heard the voice of the Father from heaven, he saw the Holy Spirit come to rest on his relative Jesus. And John says in verse 34, Now I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. That was John's mission. It was the mission that he was born for. It was the mission that he had spent his entire life preparing for. And it is the same mission that we still have today here at First Lutheran Church in Princeton, Illinois. Our mission is to point the world to the Lamb of God. Everything that we do at, here at First Lutheran must in some way be connected to that mission. Now some time ago I, I heard a story on the CBS Evening News that made a really, real impression on me and I thought about that story as I was writing this sermon. So I looked it up online the other day. It's the story of a man named Melvin Amrine and his wife Doris. They live in Little Rock, Arkansas. 
And at the time the story was done, a few years ago, they had been married for about 60 years. On the Saturday before Mother's Day, Doris had called the police to report that Melvin was missing. You see, Melvin has Alzheimer's, and he had wandered away from the house. The policeman who responded to the call found Melvin two miles away. And he couldn't remember his name. He couldn't remember where he lived. But he knew where he was going. One of the officers said he was on a mission. <laughs> you see, every year since the birth of their first child, Melvin had bought flowers for his wife on Mother's Day. And when the officers asked him where he was going, he said, tomorrow is Mother's Day, and I have to buy some flowers for my wife. <laughs> so the officers did something really awesome. First, they called in to say that they had found Melvin, that they were taking him home. But on the way home, they, they stopped at a grocery store, and they helped Melvin as he picked out a beautiful bouquet of white roses. And Melvin pulled out a few dollars from his pocket, well short of the cost of the flowers, and the officers paid the difference. And then when they got to the house, they escorted Melvin up to the front door. And when Doris saw him coming, she just broke down and cried. She said, when I saw those roses and I saw the smile on Melvin's face, I knew that the man I had fallen in love with was still in there because I could see his heart. <laughs> well, I want the world to see that heart here at First Lutheran. I want the world to see the passion that John the Baptist had for his mission here at First Lutheran. I want the world to see our heart for Jesus in everything that we do. I want them to see our mission in all that we hope to accomplish. Our mission is to point the world to Jesus Christ in everything we think and say and do. And I want to urge all of us to put aside everything that is small and unimportant. You know, anything that we, you know, we all have our personal things. We want to see this done or that done or that done. But we put it all aside. Put aside the me and point to the him. And tell the world, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's the power of the church. That is the mission of the church. That's the heart of the church. Amen and amen.